Thanks for joining us for this archive of Teaching American History's special webinar for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. The focus of tonight's program was Reform and the Pulpit, the Role of the American Church in the 19th Century Abolition Movement. We were joined by Dr. Jeff Sickinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center and Professor of Political Science at Ashland University, and Dr. Dan Monroe of Millican University. Thanks again for joining us. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm Jeff Sickinga, the Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, uh, an independent educational center located at Ashland University. And we're so glad that you could be with us tonight for the first in a two-part series uh, on reform and the pulpit. Uh, tonight's topic will be abolition and the American church. Um, this is a program co-sponsored by the Ashbrook Center and Teaching American History with uh, Missouri Humanities. And we're so delighted to be partnering with them again in offering these kinds of historical programs to you. Missouri Humanities has wonderful offerings uh, in American heritage and the heritage of Missouri. And I would encourage all of you to check out their website and check out their programs. They're doing really great work there and we're delighted to be partnering with them on this event. Uh, the Ashbrook Center and Teach American History run programs all across the country, uh, for those who aren't familiar with us, for students, teachers, and citizens. And this is one of those programs that we're happy to be with you tonight. Our mission at Ashbrook is to strengthen constitutional self-government by educating our fellow Americans in the history and principles of our country. And, and we really believe as an educational center that one of the ways that we do that most effectively is by understanding education, not just as information and definitely not as indoctrination, but as discovery as thinking for yourself. Uh, we root all of our programs in the old uh, adage going probably all the way back to Aristotle, that all people desire to know, but we add, but they don't wanna to be told. They wanna to discover the truth for themselves. And we find that really a great way to do that kind of discovery is through conversation. So we're gonna have a conversation tonight about this really important and interesting topic, which is, uh, um, so important to understanding the history of the United States before the Civil War, but of course still resonates in important ways with the situation that we face in America today. So it's our belief that we can discover uh, the truth uh, and pursue that truth together about this important question and topic and, and gain some insight, some historical perspective on the issues that our country has faced and perhaps continues to face even in 2020. So I want to welcome you into that conversation that we'll be having tonight. Please send your questions through the Q&A function, uh, not through chat, but through Q&A, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we possibly can. Often there are more than we can get to, and I'm sorry in advance if we're not able to get to all of them, but we will certainly try. And joining me for that conversation tonight is Dr. Dan Monroe. Uh, Dan is the John Griswold Distinguished Professor of History at Millican University in Illinois. Um, he is the chair of the Department of History also there at Millican. Uh, he's a man of many accomplishments. Uh, he and I were just talking before we went on that, about the fact that he's in his second year of his term as the president of the Illinois State Historical Society and uh, a really important organization in Illinois that's keeping the study of history in really great ways alive and uh, Dan has been at the helm now in his second year there. It, he was educated in his bachelor's degree at Bradley University, received his master's from Illinois State University, and his PhD from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. A man uh, widely published, a really interesting and, and thought-provoking scholar. Uh, one of his first, and to my mind, one of the most interesting books in his, early 19th century history that I've read is his book, The Political Vision of John Tyler. Uh, some, not always uh, one of the most studied presidents, but an important <laughs> thinker, <laughs> president and thinker. Uh, and Dan did a great job in sort of rehabilitating the, the reputation of John Tyler as a person to take seriously in trying to understand 19th century America. He's also written a, a really good and interesting book called At Home with Illinois Governors, uh, a social history 
of the Executive Mansion in Illinois. He is a teacher in a course at his university, but also in Ashbrook's Master of Arts in American History and Government program, which we sponsor for teachers. Uh, he's taught a lot of courses for us, but he's taught some of the most notable are sectionalism and civil war, uh, civil war and reconstruction, and a really interesting fun class, which the uh, teachers love on Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway, and his the literature of Hemingway. So Dan, thank you so much for joining us on this topic tonight. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Jeff, and I appreciate your kind and uh, generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you. If, if you don't mind, maybe we could start with, I know you had some documents that you uh, ha had us take a look at, and one of those documents you give us is the Declaration of Sentiments from the, anti -America, the, anti, the American Anti-Slavery Society, which was put out, I think, in 1833. So take us back for a minute to 1833. You know, we're talking tonight about abolition and the American church uh, before the Civil War. That year of 1833, take us back there. What's the state of the country with respect to slavery? Um, what are the various positions that have developed in the country from the founding to 1833, and maybe even including the positions in the American church in that decade? So that's a great question, and I'm delighted to start with that. Um, 1833, or the decades prior to 1833, we'll just kind of work up to it, uh, were marked by the Second Great Awakening, a kind of redefinition of American Christianity. Since we're dealing with the pulpit tonight uh, and abolitionism, let's start with American Christi Christianity and its change, the change that's being affected at the beginning of the 19th century in doctrine, and that is specifically um, the idea that salvation could be achieved by deeds. You know, the old predestinarianism of American Protestantism was regarded as outmoded and you had revivalist ministers crisscrossing the uh, wilderness and bringing a new vision of American Christianity that allowed people a great deal more agency in whether they achieve salvation. In other words, uh, the old uh, predestinarianism, I was either going to heaven or hell, and that had all been predetermined by God, and I could only look for signs about what my fate would be. But under this new doctrine, very emblematic of the 19th century, in the Jacksonian period, um, uh, theologians argued that in fact you could affect your fate by how you acted. Um, if you did good deeds, if you fought against evil, if you lived a godly life, you could earn and affect your way into heaven. Now that's a dramatic change. And what came with that was, what came with those revivals then, was the creation in western New York and um, in Ohio, places, you know, were referred to as kind of the burned over district. You had the creation of what were called benevolent societies. And these benevolent societies essentially were evangelical Christians who established Sabbath schools, Sunday schools, uh, churches for the poor, or who people that regarded as downtrodden. And it was out of that, that the abolition movement grew. Now, this isn't the only wellspring out of which abolitionism grows but it's one of the most significant ones. And it was in part inspired by the British abolition movement, which, you know, speaking of 1833, this is my tie back to 1833, a part of it, British abolition movement, which, uh, um, you know, was heavily influenced by William Wilberforce, who was an evangelical Christian, who had been a kind of, well, I'm talking about Wilberforce now, had been kind of a party animal as a young man. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, gave up his debauchery and embraced evangelical Christianity and devoted his life to abolitionism. Well, in 1833, the British um, uh, Parliament outlawed uh, slavery in the uh, empire, uh, specifically in the West Indies. So um, there was a dramatic debate in the British Parliament in 1830 over the initial, some of the initial um, legislation related to this. They didn't achieve their goal until 1833, but in 1830, there was a rather dramatic debate. And uh, American evangelicals, I think, were inspired by that. And so for that was one of the reasons why, you know, when you talk about 1833, 1830 is kind of the beginning, I think, really, of the uh, change in the American, abolition, the American abolition movement from a kind of genteel, laid-back, you know, George Washington freeing his slaves and his will type movement uh, 
to a much more of a social movement. And the people who embrace it are these evangelical Christians, um, people like Arthur and Lewis Tappan, uh, who embrace the, uh, you know, who are inspired by Wilberforce's uh, movement in Britain and see the United States as the next logical place for the abolition movement against slavery to carry on now that it's been eliminated in the empire. Now, Garrison is part of this too. I don't want to necessarily, you know, obviously I don't want to leave him out. You know, Garrison has com comes from a rather tragic background. You know, his father abandoned his family uh, when he was a child and kind of went off on a bender and was never seen again. And he was raised in utter poverty, apprenticed as a printer and kind of worked his way up. But he was fired by these same kind of the the same kind of evangelical Christian fervor that was uh, that was just part of the atmosphere of people who were interested in reform movements. So of course, Garrison starts the Liberator. Uh, in 1831 and, and begins his abolition crusade around the same time. Um, and and it, this, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, you, that's a good. You mentioned the Tappans. Um, right. that's, uh, probably uh, names that are terribly familiar to many of us, but isn't it right that they were in part, I think, financiers of, of William Lloyd Garrison and other abolitionist publications? Yeah, that's right. That Arthur and Lewis Tappan were business people. Who uh, uh, Lewis Tappan founded the Mercantile Exchange in New York City, was very successful. Um, you know, Garrett Smith. Uh, these also another successful businessman. These guys were kind of the money men, but they were also committed evangelicals uh, who you know did their own kind of proselytizing um, as you know in favor of the abolition movement. But they not only so in other words, they not only used their person but also their, uh, their finances to support it as well. Uh, so go ahead. I was just going to say then, so th that's, a, that's a segment of evangelical Christianity. And that's really interesting, that sort of Atlantic influence coming out of, uh, I'm thinking of John Wesley or Charles yes. Spurgeon. These are British theologians and preachers, uh, Methodism as a social movement, really, sort of, and they're powerfully uh, anti-slavery. Uh, I think John Newton and Amazing Grace, the hymn that everyone is so familiar with. And, and Absolutely. The, the name, I think that's the name of the movie about William Wilberforce, which I recommend to people if they haven't seen. But there is this, that's interesting. You say there's this movement of ideas that, that's there in a genteel form in America, rooted in things like the Declaration of Independence, but it doesn't become a social movement until it's infused by those sort of evangelical uh, social ideas. Uh, and theological ideas. Well, oh, and I, that's exactly yeah. right. And that's one of the, oh, it's just, I was just going to say, it's one of the reasons why I purposely wanted to mention Wilberforce, because I think sometimes when we talk about the uh, abolition movement in the United States, it's like it's the Immaculate Conception. It's, you know, it just springs up. And there, and actually, the, it, it, and there is an element of that. I mean, it is very much an indigenous movement, but I also think it's important to recognize that strong influence of the British anti-slavery movement. I mean, I think people forget um, the influence that Britain continued to have in American culture. Uh, you know, they were the enemy, but uh, but be that as it may, people were still very interested in, in British culture. It was still influential. Uh, British, Christian, you know, uh, the kind of evangelical Christianity that was sweeping Britain was of interest in the United States as well. So, and I, I'm glad you mentioned too the Declaration because I think that's an important part of the story too, Jeff. It is true that the ideas of the Enlightenment tended to discredit slavery. And the ideas in the Declaration, everyone recognized were utterly antithetical to, sl to slavery. So you have this kind of twin, these twin tracks that the anti-slavery movement is going down on the one hand, Evangelical Christianity, which I think sometimes gets, and, and its ties to Wilberforce and its influence of Wilberforce in the British movement, sometimes gets given short shrift in the embrace of Garrisonianism. So we've, we, we've avoided that. But I think we, we also need to mention that just the very ideals of the United States as embodied in the Declaration are antithetical to slavery as an institution. You know, those natu the natural rights doctrine. Everyone recognized that uh, slavery is untenable with those. And that's clearly, in, I'm thinking of that Declaration of Sentiments, they use phrases like, the right to enjoy liberty is inalienable. Uh, slavery is a usurpation of the law of nature. Boy, that sounds like it's straight out of Declaration of Independence talk. Um, that's a slice of Christianity in America. 
uh, I, I sometimes think that, especially we, we who are teaching high school and college students, who, we, who look back now and say, well, obviously everybody was an abolitionist, right? It was just a matter of somehow <laughs> things happen. Um, I think perhaps we forget what a tiny minority, the kind of abolitionists that you had us reading, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, what a tiny minority they were, even in the American church. Tell us a little bit more about what the situation is in the American church with respect to slavery by the time we get to the 1830s and 1840s. Well, that's a, another great question. Uh, and the answer is the American church was divided by the institution of slavery. Um, and, and I think tragically so. I mean, you had actual sects like the Methodists, like the Presbyterians that eventually sundered as national organizations because they uh, could not agree on condemning the institution of slavery. And so I, I, I think we, you know, and this is something that comes out in the Douglas document. I think it's important to note that while the abolition movement, evangelical Christianity is one of the wellsprings of the abolition movement, it's also important to note that the established church was not necessarily, uh, or portions of it were not necessarily uh, in favor of abolitionism and regarded it as a kind of radical movement that was anti, you know, dangerous to the country, dangerous to union. Um, there was a group of, con you know, just to give one example, in 1836, there was a group of congregational ministers who uh, came together and uh, jointly declared that they would not allow their pulpit to be used by abolitionist speakers. You know, no one, no one could be uh, allowed the pulpit in their churches unless they were vetted by the uh, minister. You know, they didn't say, well, we don't want any stinking abolitionists here, but that was basically what they were, you know, they avoided saying that, but the whole idea was, well, we're just not gonna give these guys a pulpit. And um, in response to that, some youthful abolitionists, you know, young men would go to these churches and just stand up in the middle of the service and start to give an abolitionist homily, you know, uh, as a way of saying, uh, you know, we're, we're going to defy you. But the larger point is, that significant portions of the uh, church, uh, not only in the South, of course in the South, but also in the North, were leery or even hostile uh, to the abolition movement. And you made a great point, Jeff, and you, point, you know, and I think it's something that bears repeating. It's always important to remember, because I do think there's a tendency to think, well, everyone was an abolitionist in the antebellum period. No, actually not. Uh, as you said, the abolition movement Oh, through its entire existence was a tiny minority of the northern population and didn't exist at all in the south except in the consciences of people who couldn't speak up. So we've got a, a we've got a lot of questions starting to roll in as you might imagine <laughs> and some of them are, are about um, particular denominations within American Christianity. So you talked about Methodism that that seemed like at least started as being abolitionist in its tendencies and maybe overtly, but then splits. Uh, Presbyterian ministers, of course, there are some famous ones that are anti-slavery as well, but then that denomination splits later toward the Civil War. Um, one question we've got is, what about the Anglican Church in Americas, which was particularly important in some states like Virginia. It was once the established church of Virginia while it was a, co a colony, of course, and still important in the Eastern and Atlantic and Southern states. Um, what about a church like the Anglican Church, their belief on, on slavery from to when we get into the, the middle of the 19th century? Denominations like that and perhaps some others that we should be thinking about. Well, it depends on the location of the particular church. You know, churches in the South we're simply not going to allow or permit anti-slavery homilies or sermons after, say, 1835, certainly after 1840. Um, they just were not allowed. So whether it's the Anglican Church or the Baptist Church or the Methodists or the Presbyterians, what have you, Episcopalians, you're not going to be allowed in the South. The minister simply wouldn't be permitted to give, even if they were of anti-slavery sentiments, uh, to give a kind of anti-slavery uh, sermon or message. Uh, they'd simply not be supported by the parishioners and would probably be asked to leave. I think one of the most disturbing things about the antebellum period, I mean, the antebellum, I think, one of the, you know, let me just say, as a scholar of the antebellum period, it, it's, it's uh, one of the things that's most interesting about it is it's, it's dark. <laughs> you know, it has almost, almost gothic feel at times, you know. Uh, 
And one of the more, um, one of the aspects of that uh, is the church, the church in the South. You know, in the South prior to 1830, there were ministers who got up and said, gee, uh, you know, we should be kind to the slaves and maybe we need to think about some kind of a manumission process. In other words, they would give an anti-slavery homily. But after 1835, in response to the kind of Garrisonian abolition movement, that kind of discussion was simply not allowed. And even worse, the church in the South becomes a very staunch defender of slavery as an institution. You see this uh, frustration with this in Frederick Douglass's remarks, although Douglass was also frustrated with the church in the North in this regard as well, particularly in the South. I mean, there were Southern ministers who were uh, not only preaching uh, that slavery was uh, a good thing, but also that it was biblically sanctioned. And some of the stoutest defenses of slavery as an institution in the antebellum period after 1840 were written by ministers uh, in the South. And it's just kind of disturbing, uh, you know, um, that, 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 that uh, as an institution, it kind of totally switched in, in such a dramatic and sweeping fashion. Uh, and, and really, it has to be said, it becomes one of the bulwarks of uh, slavery's defense. I think, I think, in fact, in his essay, 1847, on American slavery, or his speech, um, Frederick Douglass says, I think a quote I wrote down is, the stronghold of slavery is in the pulpit. Yes. Really uh, isn't that, is that disturbing? Uh, and he, you know, and, and uh, I think that that was a fair statement. Um, I mean, not only, uh, certainly in the South, but even in the North, you know, there were, there were ministers who were not uh, supportive of, an, of the anti-slavery cause. They may have misgivings about slavery as an institution, but uh, there were, like a lot of Americans, they were more worried about the movement against slavery and its radicalism. And I think some of this was driven by Garrison. I mean, you see Garrison, the document today, I mean, Gar you know, in Garrison and Union, Garrison says the Constitution is a, co a covenant uh, uh, with death uh, covered with blood, or words to that effect. Well, that was really out there for uh, the antebellum period. And so uh, for uh, some ministers would see rhetoric like that. And, you know, I, this is just a, you know, tonight was just a minor sampling of Garrison's rhetoric. A lot of his rhetoric was much worse than that. You know, he called slavery a harlot, uh, and slave owners were vampires, uh, sucking the blood of the nation. Some ministers uh, saw, you know, rhetoric like that and simply uh, felt it was unsupportable or were disturbed by it and thought it was a threat to kind of social cohesion and social order. And well, Douglas, Douglas's argument, of course, is, well, look, uh, you find rhetoric disturbing. I find slavery <laughs> as an institution disturbing. Uh, and he goes through, uh, you know, a list of some of the abuses associated with it. So in response to that a Garrisonian heated abolitionist rhetoric, uncompromising. He says, there'll be no moderation, I will be heard. And obviously there are a slice of American Christians who are with him on that, a very small, probably slice. Is there, is there what about moderates? Let's call them that. Um, in the North and in the South, your, your suggestion that you're making is prior to 1830, you, would have, you could have met anti-slavery ministers in the South. Uh, who may have said things, moderate things, but let's reform this institution. If we have it, let's treat slaves as human beings and as brothers in Christ. This sort of, this sort of argument from the pulpit, um, probably you would have heard similar things in the North, maybe with a little more emphasis on abolition, but a, there was a kind of common ground. Talk about the split in the country that begins to happen, because one of our questioners has asked a really interesting question here, which is, how did a minority group, the abolitionists, gain momentum to become a national, social, and political issue? How they become so divisive? Yeah. It sounds like well, there was a moderate middle, and then over time in the 19th century, it, it, it split and became more extreme, including in Christianity. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but help us understand that. Uh, that's a great question. So, and I'm so glad the student uh, or the our colleague who sent in the question asked it. So here's the thing, how, you know, how does the abolition movement become so influential? In part, because the Southern reaction to the abolition movement trenched on the Bill of Rights. And people in the North who might otherwise not be overly inclined to be upset about slavery as an institution for humanitarian reasons were very concerned 
about southern states that were doing things that trenched on the Bill of Rights. For example, um, southern postmasters, I mean, the most famous example was in Charleston, South Carolina in the early 1830s, I think it's 1834. Um, the, the Jackson administration, the postmaster, Amos Kendall, allowed Southern uh, postmasters to search the mail as it came in and remove abolitionist literature because the abolition movement began to send pamphlets, uh, anti-slavery pamphlets to people in the South, which I've always found as an amusing tactic. <laughs> you know, write in your mail from, you know, your Southern slave you get this Garrisonia tract. But so postmasters are going through the mail, searching the mail and removing abolitionist literature, piling it up in the case of Charleston, piling it up in the center of town and burning it up in a big fire. And then you have, uh, so, you know, obviously that's, uh, you know, a violation of the, uh, the Bill of Rights, uh, First Amendment. Then you have uh, the uh, gag rule debate, which begins in 1836, because the abolition movement was petitioning, constantly sending petitions to Congress uh, condemning slavery um, in response to this, and then they would have to be read on the floor, referred to committee by the rules of the House. This was very vexing to Southern congressmen, so they passed a rule, passes in 1837, that immediately tabled abolitionist petitions. An abolition petition came in, it was not read on the floor, it was tabled, which effectively killed it. You know, it wasn't referred to the committee, it just went into kind of this netherland of uh, parliamentary procedure. Well, that was a violation of the right to petition, which was one of the causes of the American Revolution. As you recall, the king was petitioned and just blew off the colonists over and over again. And so the right to petition was kind of uh, vested with this revolutionary, American revolutionary kind of patriotic ardor or fervor or reverence. And John Quincy Adams, to his lasting credit, was sitting there in the house, old man eloquent, the ex-president, who rather than retire to Braintree and just, you know, read and write and grow flowers, uh, got himself elected to the congressional seat, he makes this a cause celeb and begins uh, to challenge the gag rule every time it's debated at the beginning of every Congress and then basically harasses Southerners over it. Well, it becomes a big national issue. So how does the, how does the abolition movement become a national force? Because they take their, the measures that they take, the Southern response to it, trenches on the Bill of Rights, which is very upsetting to Northern whites. You, they make abolition, you know, the, the, the cause of abolition, you know, Northern whites are kind of vaguely anti-slavery. Hmm. Seems uh, antithetical to the Declaration to me, but you know, we don't really have slavery up here, so I'm not going to, you know, get too upset about it. But wait a minute, I read in my newspaper the other day that the postmaster in Nashville or Charleston searched the mail and burned it up. Well, what if that happens in Springfield, Illinois? I don't like that, you know, and, and uh, you know, so the point is that at the abolition movement elicited a Southern response that was so extreme, it made the abolition argument more potent with Northern whites than it otherwise would have been. That's my view. I see. And that you, and you can see this, uh, pardon me for interrupting, but you can see this in the, uh, in Northern newspapers from the time period. They, they, that, that, because that looks like, as you said, that would affect them and their rights, or could at least. And if they can do it there, why can't, why can't it be done here eventually? Yeah. Well, exactly right. And, and it's, and, and, and just, just to continue your point, Jeff, it's, a, you know, this is a period where the uh, founding fathers, the revolution, and the Bill of Rights are very much part of the national vernacular and conversation still. Uh, remember, Madison is above ground until 1836. Uh, you know, I mean, they, in other words, they were not only present, they were literally present, you know, they were still alive. And so, uh, you know, the ideals of the revolution, you know, uh, you'll see uh, in uh, political campaigns for Congress and others, um, Lincoln does this against Douglas and Douglas against Lincoln, appealing to the founders and saying, well, my, the founders would support me and here's why. So my point is that, the, you know, if you're attacking or perceived as a region attacking the founders or the ideals that the founders um, uh, promoted and successfully um, engrafted onto the country, you got a big problem. You know, in other words, people, people in the North would, would look at that and say, you know, this is very concerning. Uh, you know, they're trenching on the founders' legacy. They're redefining the nature and character of the country.
one strain of abolitionism which we haven't talked about, which a questioner has brought to our attention, which I know we know is important, is the Society of Friends or Quakers. Um, they are probably some of the earliest indigenous aboli abolitionists in America. And of course, they're abolitionists pretty strongly in, back in Britain as well, and coming from Britain to America and setting up Pennsylvania, among other things. And you know, famous for being involved in uh, the Underground Railroad, for example, um, including in places like Ohio, in Eastern Ohio. T tell us a little bit about the role of Quaker Christianity in abolitionism. And are all Quakers staunch abolitionists from the beginning, or do they have the same kind of internecine struggles that other Christian denominations have? Yeah, so the, you know, it's a great question. I mean, the Quakers in many respects are also, uh, and you, you suggested this within your question, are also one of the wellsprings of the abolition movement. You know, that, that kind of Garrisonian pacifism, you know, in this document that we have, part of the packet Garrison talks about the fact that, well, you know, we're going to approach the problem of slavery through moral suasion. Uh, we eschew violence. We're not going to force anyone to do anything. We're going to appeal and make a moral argument, and we're going to win them over. Well, you know, that's Quakerism. You know, that's the, 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 it's the society of friends that in many respects has an ideology that directly translates or is one of the things that translates into mainstream, what I would call mainstream abolitionism or kind of Garrisonian abolitionism. Um, so they're very, you know, they're very much... Um, I would say ideologically, um, a kind of precursor of the abolition movement. Now, this isn't to say, and you, you, you know, your question um, hints on this as well, and, and Douglas mentions this too in his speech. Um, this isn't to say that some some Quakers weren't uncomfortable with the abolition movement. <laughs> in fact, they were. Uh, and remember, the other thing about the abolition movement in in um, uh, that we need to acknowledge within this context, in the context of the Quakers, is um, over time the abolition movement does embrace violence. You know, in the 1850s, you have the kind of John Brown, um, you know, abolition movement fighting in Kansas and leading a kind of quixotic raid against Harper's Ferry in 1859. You have Frederick Douglass abandoning his Garrisonian. Um, you know, abolitionism is Garrisonian pacifism, and essentially, um, by 1852, 1850, um, has decided that, yeah, maybe violence is necessary. So there were, you know, I guess the larger point is that I think the Quakers were strongly influential in the abolition movement. There were conservatives, for lack of a better phrase, or maybe a better way of putting it, but there were conservatives that were uh, or Quakers, I should say, that were uncomfortable with that abolition with some of Garrison's rhetoric. Um, we, and then eventually the turn to violence, at least on the part of some abolitionists. So Quakerism, just like, or the Quakers in general society of friends, just like other religious sects, shouldn't be seen as kind of monolithic. But I do think it's important to, that, that it's fair to say uh, that the society of friends, the principles of the society of friends, are a very strong, you know, and, and especially early, are very much a wellspring um, of abolitionism. And, and as a follow-up to that, our, one, a questioner asks, uh, how did the Society of Friends, or maybe more broadly, Christian denominations that were uh, anti-slavery, uh, Quakers, for example, would sometimes buy slaves in order to free them? Um, and this person actually says, I've seen documentation of those slaves still living with Quakers on census records. Is this, um, again, a kind of a sign of the adaptation of those Quaker principles uh, to circumstances? Is that an uncommon thing? And would we have seen that in other Christian denominations? Well, that's a great question. And I think the answer is it's an adaptation. But I also think that, uh, you know, you talk about the Underground Railroad. There were lots of Christian denominations that assisted with the Underground Railroad. Now, the Quakers are, were, uh, again, maybe the wellspring of that. I mean, uh, the Underground Railroad is a somewhat, uh, I want to say sketchy, but, you know, it's in other words, it's hard to get your fingers on it all the times because it's uh, this, uh, by definition, it's a secretive organization. But certainly the Quakers participated, other Christian denominations participated, that kind of Quaker um, desire to help the downtrodden, um, 
you know, and to, and this was, a, you know, one of the great ways to do that, you know, helping slaves, escape slaves along to Canada uh, or to parts north where they would be safe. Um, so I wouldn't, I would say that uh, in, in a lot of ways, the Underground Railroad, um, you know, the Quakers are, should be given the credit for being, you know, uh, uh, one of the beginners of that whole organization, but it's also, um, uh, I think, true that other, very true that other other denominations participated in it very vigorously. And would we have seen, and I know that Quakers are geographically located in Pennsylvania primarily, and then of course into Eastern Ohio and places like that, but right. would we have seen Quaker congregations in the South and if there were, would they have been abolitionists? So I'm really interested in this idea of the, the, the possibility, I'm thinking of the Grimke sisters, for example, yeah. of Southern evangelicals or Southern Christians who remain abolitionists past the point that you're talking about, which is you're saying there's a fulcrum in America in the South in about the 1830s, where it starts to swing and the, toward pro-slavery in a very hardened way. Um, are there still abolitionist Christians in the South after that time, and how are they maintaining themselves? Well, that's a, this is a great question. And I, I think it's, I'm glad you asked it because I think it's important not to see uh, the South as this kind of region of uh, uh, unity and opinion. You know, in other words, I think there's sometimes a tendency to see everybody in the South is pro-slavery and everyone in the South was in favor of the Confederacy and, and secession. No, actually, uh, very, very, not at all. Uh, it's important to note that during the Civil War, there were regions in the South that remained uh, very pro-Union and were staunchly opposed to secession and the Confederate government to the point of firing on Confederate troops if they came in that in in those areas. You know, in other words, they take shots at them because they were mad about the whole thing. <laughs> so this is a long way of saying that. Of course, there were people of anti-slavery sentiments who still lived in the South, uh, but you, you, you had to be careful. I mean, you would be uh, subject to uh, violence if you got up on a soapbox and started to give a kind of anti-slavery homily or, or political talk. I mean, it simply would not be permitted, uh, and you would be driven out. But, uh, you know, it, it would be... I, 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 I think that it's actually a, a wonderful uh, um, and interesting uh, research question in the, in, in the sense of wouldn't it be, you know, if you could ferret out with any precision the numbers of these people. We know they were there um, uh, in part because we know after Reconstruction begins, there are white Southern whites who embrace it and embrace Reconstruction and presumably at least some of them were of those convictions prior to Reconstruction. In other words, they were in favor of black social and political equality and, and abolitionism. So yeah, they're, they're still there. They're still, uh, but, but I, I also think it would be fair to say they're largely forced underground uh, by social ostracism and then by the, uh, the threat of violence. What about, what, what happens in the North as abolitionism in American Christianity in the South becomes as Frederick Douglass described it in 1847 and, and after that. And we see that, for example, in the Cornerstone speech, right? Where there's certain key theological arguments that are made, and we even have a question on that. Some of the key theological arguments that you would hear in the Southern areas justifying slavery, the curse of Ham, for example, uh, uh, after the flood, um, the uh, New Testament passages, slaves obey your masters, uh, those sorts of things, well, I would imagine, were pretty common from the Southern pulpit in those times. That And that becomes the dominant mode of, of, of discourse from the pulpit in the South. And that's what Frederick Douglass says. It's a real rampart. He implies that in the North, and you alluded to this, that in the North, the pulpit, you're not hearing those kind of things, but you're not hearing a lot of social justice arguments either, for lack of better term. Or, the, the, or as he puts it, the abolitionist goal is to convince Americans that slavery is a sin against God. And he says, we're not doing very well. <laughs> he actually <laughs> says that in 1847, that yeah. Garrison's task has been that and has not been able to get a hold of the Northern clergy in order to do that. When 
what are the obstacles to that? And when does that start to change? Because we've got a question here about the influence of the Beecher family. Of course, a very famous abolitionist family and preacher. Um, when does, what are the obstacles to the Northern clergy becoming more abolitionist? And, and does that change so that by the time we get toward the Civil War, they become more openly abolitionist or really not even until that time? Uh, I think the church, uh, you know, the, the majority, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to quantify. And so I should probably be careful and not even try. But I think there were significant portions of the church that always were, were uncomfortable with abolitionism as a movement. They regarded it as too radical. Uh, there was an element of racism within this. You know, they, they had bought into the uh, argument that blacks were inferior and therefore were fitted to be slaves. And just, just were, uh, were not ready or prepared to embrace what they regarded as a kind of radical leap into kind of an e a misty egalitarianism. Uh, you know, it has to be said that the church is often a very conservative institution and, and ministers are not, you know, uh, don't rush and embrace the, the, the latest nostrum or, or a national faith, you know, fad, or what they would view as that as a national. And so I think that's, this is a, a, an example of this as well in the antebellum period where you have ministers just simply not, you know, look, reading, a, you know, reading an edition of the Liberator and seeing Garrison saying the things that he said, and then uh, Frederick Douglass saying some of the things he said and feeling uncomfortable with that rhetoric and not willing to be, uh, to turn the pulpit over to them. Now, I think they were wrong. Uh, and, and it also should be said that there were plenty of ministers who, who got it. Uh, you know, you mentioned the Beechers, um, who gave anti-slavery anti, uh, homilies, who spoke strongly against slavery, who recognized, I think correctly, that the Bible properly read is an anti-slavery document. Um, you, know, I, you know, Frederick Douglass quotes Exodus uh, in his speech, uh, probably, you know, the favorite cha chapter of the Bible in the Old Testament of slaves, um, and rightfully so. But it, you know, it, it was something that was constantly, you know, Douglas would travel around and give speeches and not be allowed to speak in the church. You know, you'd have a little town and one of the most prominent buildings where everyone gathers for meetings is the church. And he's, and the minister says, no, no, you can't, you can't use this. So he'd have to go to a field or some other place. It was very frustrating to him because as, as Douglas was, as, you know, Douglas was a Christian. Uh, especially early in his life, I think at the, at, towards the end of his life, he kind of drifts a little bit away from the church, although I think he, he's always still a Christian. Um, I don't think he ever abandoned Christianity, but very, very, you know, early in his life, um, Douglas knew the Bible and was, a, you know, a devout Christian and was very frustrated by this because in his view, these, these ministers weren't, you know, preaching the gospel. You know, they, were, they, were, they weren't doing what a minister is supposed to do. And that is, of course, um, you know, tend to the most disadvantaged in the populace. So tell us a little bit about some of the abolitionist preachers, maybe the Beecher family, you can say more about that, Harry Beecher Stowe, of course, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, who, how do they, how does that anti-slavery momentum begin to grow? in the pulpit, if it does, in, in the 1840s and 50s. Um, it's Northern public opinion is moved, as you said, the non sort of Christian opinion is moved by assault on the Bill of Rights, which is a really interesting insight, I think, for all of us. But yeah. what about the, does, does anti-slavery opinion grow in Northern pulpits in the 1840s and 50s? Oh, I think it does, you know, I think, uh, and you talked about the Beechers, I mean, um, I don't think enough can be said about the influence of uh, Harry Beecher Stowe. You had, you know, I talked about earlier the, um, uh, the concern that Northern whites felt about the trenching on the Bill of Rights. You know, the Southern response to the abolition movement was to restrict the freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, you, know, you know, these precious rights that Americans thought so highly of, they insisted they be part of the Constitution, at, uh, you, know, right at, you know, right after the Constitutional Convention, after the freaking thing passes. We've got to have a Bill of Rights. So you have that concern. And then Harriet Beecher Stowe publishes her wonderful novel. And who is the hero of the novel but the, uh, you know, the escaping slave? Harriet Beecher Stowe, 
humanizes black Americans for white Americans. And the book was immensely successful. I wanted to sell like 300,000 copies its first year. Uh, everybody read it. Every thinking person read it or got a, you know, read a portion of it. Um, and so Stowe, and I think this is true of Edward and, and the other Beecher too as well, Stowe humanizes the slaves. So you have Northern whites beginning to think of the, uh, you know, recognizing, gee, these black Americans are just like me. They're worried about the fate of their children and don't want to see them sold away to the, and, and are willing to take a risk to save them of walking across, you know, running across the Ohio River when it's, you know, through broken ice. Well, I can relate to that because I love my children as well. You know, this is, of course, an age, too, of very high child mortality. So Stowe humanizes his life. So you have that growing concern with the morality of slavery now married to that previous concern about slavery as an institution trenching on the Bill of Rights. Uh, you know, or, you know, you know, political uh, concerns or concerns over individual freedom now married to um, uh, the argument of morality. And this is what Be the Beecher family was doing from the pulpit. Edward Beecher uh, founded a little college in uh, Jacksonville, Illinois, just west of me, where I'm sitting this evening, uh, freezing <laughs> on the prairie because it's cold here in Illinois. But at any rate, the whole, the whole reason that uh, Edward Beecher founded that college was, uh, or one of the reasons was, he wanted to establish this kind of bastion of anti-slavery sentiment in what he regarded as the Northwest. You know, this, at that time, the antebellum period, this new region where new settlers are coming in, and we need to have a kind of outpost here of, um, you know, anti-slavery sentiment, also, also anti-Catholicism. You know, Beecher was uh, strongly anti-Catholic as well, but... Um, so yes, that's absolutely what's happening in the 40s and 50s. You see that argument being made from the pulpit and Harry Beecher Stowe's novel, immensely influential and I think uh, helps Northern whites uh, see the slave as less a kind of abstract thing and slavery as a kind of abstract problem and now uh, as an issue of morality, of, of humanity. You know, I can relate. I can relate to the suffering of the slaves because I can relate to Eliza and what she went through to try to save her children. Yeah, and and the Christian themes, of course, in that novel are are explicit and open and very present, right? Absolutely, so it right. Shy away from connecting Christianity to the cause of of abolition. Oh, that's a great point. I think, and I think uh, throughout the, you know, the um, this is something I think often gets missed. If you look at uh, um, not, you know, the literature of the period, newspaper articles, even political speeches, you'll see the, th the Christian themes are studded through them. I mean, Lincoln, who was an agnostic, is constantly using biblical references. Uh, so I, I think, uh, I, I remember seeing Margaret Washington, who's a marvelous historian, history professor, say uh, on a, in a documentary, um, you know, religion permeated society the way it's difficult for us to realize today, because we live in a kind of post-Christian age, regrettably. Uh, but so the, the point is that um, the Christian argument against slavery is ever present. And as you suggested, Jeff, in the 40s and 50s is growing stronger and more potent. Yeah. And I'm thinking of places like uh, Charles Finney uh, establishing Oberlin College, uh, the founding of Hillsdale College in 1844 by abolitionist Baptists, a lot of small, and they're founded to train ministers, preachers and teachers. Uh, my own university, Ashland University, it's founded after, but by brethren, again, the preachers and teachers um, mode, and those are staunchly abolitionist places who are turning out deliberately preachers for the pulpit, starting in the 1840s and later, to bring the abolitionist interpretation of Christianity out more broadly. Oh, absolutely right. I mean, Lane Seminary in Cincinnati, Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois. Um, I mean, the you know Illinois College in Jacksonville. Uh, I mean, that's exactly right. These these were uh, places to train men in the gospel, and they would then go out and part and part of it was uh, their message was not only the gospel but the anti-slavery. You know, these were the vanguard, th these people were going to be the vanguard of the uh, anti-slavery movement um, and, and would, you know, make the argument, that moral suasion argument that at the end, um, idealistically, they felt would win out. 
and I think in some respects um, was winning out in the 1850s. Um, you know, I, not, not that the Civil War could have been prevented or anything, but I, I think the abolition movement w was um, much more influential by the 1850s than it was uh, at the beginning of its, uh, you know, the early 18, 1830s, say. You, you mentioned Lincoln. Um, we have a question about that. And of course, I'm also really interested in this question. What about Christian abolitionists and their relationship to Abraham Lincoln? or to the Republican Party as it's formed in the mid 1850s? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, the abolition movement and, and Christian abolitionists, I think had a kind of uh, love-hate relationship with Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was a Whig, uh, or a lot longer than he was a Republican. He becomes a Republican in 1855. Um, and Lincoln's approach to slavery was a moderate approach. You know, Lincoln was in favor of gradual compensated emancipation followed by colonization. And he was against the extension of slavery. That was his policy. Uh, he says this over and over again. He's very blunt about it. It was also Henry Clay's policy, uh, by and large. So, um, you know, Lincoln's, in other words, Lincoln was trying to find that kind of middle ground on an issue of which there really isn't a middle ground. But he was trying for the sake, I think, of social order and, and to try to avoid violence. Um, so there's tremendous, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, frustration with Lincoln at, at times. You know, his first year in the uh, White House as president, um, the abolition, you, if you read, uh, you know, Garrison and others, Frederick Douglass, they're pulling their hair out because Lincoln isn't freeing the slaves, you know, isn't immediately making a kind of emancipation contest. And uh, of course, Lincoln is trying to keep the border states on board um, and, and, you know, avoid, you know, dissension within the union movement. Uh, so there's tremendous frustration. It also has to be said that, um, you know, Lincoln famously gets up in the debates with Douglas in 1858 and explicitly says, look, I think the Declaration of Independence includes black Americans. Because Douglas, Stephen Douglas, and other Democrats had been saying, look, we, we don't think the Declaration of Independence has anything to do with black people. It was written by whites for whites. And Lincoln, to his credit, gets up and says in a very, in a, in a state, Illinois, that had a strong anti-black tradition, well, I don't think that's right. In fact, I think the Declaration includes all people. I don't think Jefferson meant to exclude blacks. If he had meant to do that, he would have said that explicitly. The natural rights doctrines of the Declaration are for all peoples, regardless of race or anything else. Well, that was immensely pleasing to abolitionists. Uh, you know, in other words, and, and it has to be said that by doing that, Lincoln made, uh, you know, was again making an argument that made slavery untenable. Now, you can't have slavery in a natural rights republic. You either have a natural rights republic founded on those principles and no slavery, or you don't have a natural rights republic. And that was part of Lincoln's argument was, look, if we're really going to be a natural rights republic, we can't have slavery. If we permit this, we're gonna drift into, you know, if we allow slavery to grow, we're gonna become something that we do not want to be, <laughs> that we were never intended to be. Uh, and we're gonna morph into this other thing. And I don't think anybody wants that. So I think it's one of the things, one of the things that abolitionists and others recognized that Lincoln deserves tremendous credit for was his putting that to the country in stark bluntness. Now we have to arrest the path or arrest the drift on which we are in, or we're going to become something that's antithetical to the natural rights republic that we were intended to be. It was what a great about, message. Yeah. What about when the war starts? We've got a few minutes left and, Christian abolitionists, um, uh, Garrisonian types. The war starts. They're not sure about this Lincoln guy. They like his anti-slavery sentiments, but he doesn't seem like he's one of them. And he sort of goes out of his way at times to distance himself from them. Uh, he's not Parson Lovejoy, as he was always accused of. <laughs> he's not an abolitionist preacher. <laughs> right. Um, what happens at the beginning of the war with Christian abolitionists do they join the cause? Do they still embrace their pacifism, that, that older tradition of, of uh, evangelical Christian abolitionism? What happens in, let's say, 1860, 61, 62? Yeah, I think that uh, there's a kind of sea change. Now, again, we don't have Gallup polling data, but I think it's reasonable to, to, to make the argument that there was a kind of sea change that began with the Brown Raid. Uh, 
uh, in, on Harper's Ferry in 59. And that is to say that uh, abolitionists who were pacifists revered Brown and recognized that Brown had, uh, you know, I think there was a certain frustration among the abolitionist movement uh, that the, you know, three decades of moral suasion had done squat. You know, nothing had happened. And now Brown had actually done something, although it was a futile gesture, it was nevertheless a kind of direct blow, you know, a direct blow against the institution of slavery. And I think there's a gradual change in public opinion within the abolitionist movement as in response to that. Now, it isn't to say that it hadn't been going on before, you know, it is to say, I think in the 1850s, there was kind of a growing, uh, you know, with the violence in Kansas and the Dred Scott decision, which was an outrage. Uh, you know, there's a kind of growing frustration with moral suasion and this endless pacifism. So, but Brown kind of pushes, I think, everyone in the direction. So the point is, when the war begins, I think the ab abolitionists, the kind of Garrisonian abolitionists, are prepared to embrace violence by the events that have preceded it. And in fact, they do. You know, Garrison himself says, well... I've been a pacifist, but you know, we have to support this war. Uh, you know, it, it appears that violence is necessary to end this scourge. Um, and, and, um, and others said the same thing. So I think, you know, the, the, there, there's, a, there's a willingness, and I think some of this is just a product of years of, uh, of frustration. You know, the, 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 the kind of phrase of the hour in April of 1861 was, uh, the argument is exhausted. You know, in other words, we've talked and talked and talked, We've, we've, you know, yelled at each other until we're hoarse. Now we want to just grapple, you know, now we just want to get at it. It's just, you know, it's sad commentary uh, because it leads to this hideous fratricidal civil war. But there's a, there's a willingness to embrace violence by 61 and 62. Wow. So that's so interesting. Uh, amazingly, our t we're at the end of our time. Uh, it's flown by. <laughs> Thank it you went so fast. Much. It was, uh, this was awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan, for joining us. Uh, really appreciate your insights. Um, I hope everybody, I, I'm sorry again to those, we didn't get a chance to address everybody's question. We had so many tonight, uh, such a stimulating, interesting topic. But thank you, um, for Dan, for joining us again. And thank you all uh, for joining us as well. We really appreciate this. As I said, this is the first of two uh, in a series that we're putting on with the pulpit and reform, the role of Christianity in social reform movements. Um, to next week, we'll be talking about post-World War II Christianity and the civil rights movement and the interesting relationship between Christianity and civil rights and the complicated and complex relationship between American Christianity and the civil rights movement. I encourage you to join us for that. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Ashbrook or about teachingamericanhistory.org. Look us up online, uh, Teaching American History for Teachers Out There, a wonderful resource. Primary documents, a huge collection. Uh, the documents that Dan had us look at for this webinar came from there. A, a lot of great stuff, tah.org, teachingamericanhistory, tah.org. You'll be sent a link to a recording of today's uh, webinar. So please take a look at that. If you want to re listen to it, rewatch it, send it to your friends, send it to your colleagues, your family. Delighted to have them also participate with us in that way. Uh, we really believe here that we can learn from history. Uh, that's why we teach it. That's why we talk about it with students, to have a conversation, to kind of gain some historical perspective on our country. And I think also to renew our understanding of the principles of this country and so many insightful things said tonight about those very principles. So we appreciate you being with us. Look forward to seeing you next week. And please stay healthy, stay hopeful, and stay connected with Ashbrook. And thanks again to the Missouri Humanities for co-sponsoring this event. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to this webinar archive from Ashbrook and Teaching American History. You can learn more about our free documents library, our teaching resources, and our programs at teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org.